Welcome to our cafe for We Are One United. My name is John Epps. I'm the CEO and your host tonight. I am uh, very excited that we are able to use these cafes as a way to communicate with our community and to introduce what we think are some of the interesting and exciting people who make up our community. Uh, we Are One United is a uh, social enterprise that is focused on uh, employment development, on community development, and on people development. We really believe in our communities. And so we are happy when we get an opportunity to come to you with these cafes because we think that they will give you a chance to know more about not just us, but the people we work with. Um, you know, we have different cafes each week. Uh, in one week, we do youth cafes. Another week, we do uh, economic development cafes. And this week, we're going to talk about community development. And I have a special guest. Uh, a young man that I met just recently here in uh, Coachella Valley. Let me say a, a word or, or two about him. Edwin, Edwin Ramorian is an independent curator and a human rights, rights commissioner for the city of Palm Springs. And Edwin, I'm not going to try to pronounce his name. I'm going to let you help me when I get to it. But you're the co finder of Bayana Han uh, Desert, which is a cultural center in Coachella Valley, which is dedicated to bringing uh, Filipinos together and connecting with communities of others uh, of color through public programs and civic engagement. Edwin has a long lasting career working as a curator, community engagement director across the country. Whether it's connecting with people through cultural exchanges or art, we all hope that we can take something from tonight's meeting. And so Edwin, I wanna say welcome. I know that um, our team has been waiting for this meeting and I'm looking forward to learning more about the center and about the work that you have been doing so did you want to say a, a thing or two about yourself before we start uh, looking at our questions? Sure. Uh, thank you, okay. John. For such a, it's such an honor to be here, John. And thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Is is the volume OK for can you can everyone hear me OK? Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. I want I want to I want to thank you, John. And I want to thank you, Jill Ska and Kwana and um, and of course, um, Lauren, um, who had introduced me to we are one united and we, I'm so excited to be part of this cafe. So I've got my cafe ready. So I'll, cheers to everyone. Yeah. So cafe, cheers. <laughs> um, a little sip. I made, I made a Vietnamese today. So it's, it's a French roast with um, some condensed milk. Um, I'm, I'm really excited. I'm, I've been, you know, I was born and raised here in Palm Springs. I'll, I'll, I'll keep this quick. Um, I was born and raised in Palm Springs and um, graduated from the, I, I'm so happy you said a young man, <laughs> Mr. Epps, because it's like, I'm going to be turning 51 in, in a couple weeks, but um, I was born and raised here in Palm Springs, um, so I was born in Desert Hospital before it was called Desert Regional. I was, a, I was part of the class of 1989 at Palm Springs High, and I'm so, I'm so, I'm such a proud graduate of that school and I also attended of course Sierra Vista Elementary which is half a block away from my where I'm, where I'm living with this is the house where I was born and raised in in Veterans Tract <clears throat> near Duluth Park and we were bused as junior high school kids to uh, to um to Cathedral City to Nellie and Kaufman Middle School so it was very different um, it was my sister my younger sister who who attended Raymond Cree in Palm Springs but that gives you a little background. I, I, I've been back. I was um, the other part of me is that I was living in 20 uh, for 20 years in, in New York as a curator. And my last job there was a manager of community engagement and public programs at the Studio Museum in Harlem. 
And when I came back here, I was like, what do I do? You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um, mom and dad were like, so they were so gracious. I mean, they were so, um, they invited me back home to help take care um, of things at the at the house here, you know, where I was born and raised, as well as take care of them. Um, and they, they were both um, getting along in their age, elderly. This is 2014 when I moved back. So it was eight years ago that I moved back to Palm Springs to, to, to be here. Um, and in the meantime, I, I was, you know, looking for jobs. So I, I even worked at a uh, at a gay resort here in Palm Springs for a year. I, I went to direct a gallery in downtown Los, Los Angeles for a couple of years. And then mom and dad both got sick. So it's been sort of a, one, a real, um, a real development as a caregiver, as a home health caregiver for my parents. Um, so dad passed away in 2019. Mom only just passed away a couple months ago this year. So it's been, we've, we had two elders in the Filipino community in my neighborhood that had just passed away. And we've, you know, we've seen a, a number of elders uh, pass away. Clearly uh, th that generation, um, dad was 91, mom was 87. So we're, we're talking about a, a very, you know, an older set of uh, a generation that's like, that's leaving. Um, so that's just a quick sort of background of who I am. I've been really interested. It's, it's uh, pronounced by Nihan. By Nihan Desert was founded actually in 2019 after the districting of, a Palm, of Palm Springs. Um, uh, we were in, at, uh, we, voting in the, the city of Palm Springs was at large. So everyone was voting for their representatives for the city council. Uh, we're in, um, with the, the, the California Voting Rights Act, um, we, we, there, our city finally caught up <laughs> to the idea that you know representation really does matter. So um, I was part of the committee that, that helped form the first district, um, minority majority district one, um, as well as help map out the city of Palm Springs to really look at the demographics. Um, and, you know, coming out of the Filipino community in Palm Springs, it's always been um, just a, a proud part of who I am. So I'm very happy to like answer any questions about it. You know, we're, we're we, with by Neon Desert, we we found we were founded as a an, infor an informal group actually of of citizens within Palm Springs as well as the greater Palm Springs area, and we we, we were founded to really de help develop community engagement and civic engagement with uh, Filipino residents and uh, here in Palm Springs and the Coachella Valley. So it's been a great adventure to to sort of like bridge you know the generations the generational gaps. Um, and and sort of build voting, you know, voters, uh, active voters in Palm Springs. Well, thank you. So thank, thank you for having me. Thank thank you, Evan. What one of the questions that came to mind as I was listening is, can you tell us a little bit about the history of the Filipino population in the valley, and maybe a little bit about how people came to be here and and what they were doing? Sure. I'm, I'm always really, um, as an art history uh, student and hist a student of history, I've, I'm always been int intrigued by sort of how people get to where they're at. And, you know, why, you know, I, I think growing up, we were always asking our parents, why, why are we here? Why are we in the desert? Why is this, it's so hot. <laughs> what are we doing here? Why, you know, why are we in the desert? So there's this real um, sense of the one, um, I, I was very, as a human rights commissioner for the city of Palm Springs, and also as a as a, as a member of uh, By Neon Desert and a, a lot of different sort of organizing um, organizations here in in, the, in Coachella Valley. We were we were really interested in seeing what that history looks like. And so we a couple of years ago we were we were we were part of like helping draft the proclamation for this for the city of Palm Springs to look at you know the, the history of, of Filipinos in you know not only in, in the in Coachella Valley but also. The, the you know nationally um and um i i'm so happy that one of the things that came out of it was this pro proclamation and it's blurred because my background is blurred but i'm going to read this actually gives the wonderful thing about this proclamation it provides this wonderful quick outline of the history of filipinos in the united states thank you and, and i'll if, if if you will indulge me I'll, it'll take me maybe a, a good couple of minutes to go through it real, real real quickly so is that okay mr epps it's perfect please Thank you. I, I, um, I'm not too academic, even though you and I are both UC Riverside like folks, but I, <laughs> I, I, I can make it academic if you want it. Um, I, I actually realized when I was going through the proclamation that was that was accepted by the city, I, I looked at my old draft and there was some there was an ex exclusion that I wanted to include here in, in the conversation here. And the, the, that inclusion is um, 
The Philippines was declared, uh, declared its independence from Spain on June 12th of 1898. This is very important. Yet it was ceded by Spain through the Treaty of Paris to the United States after the Spanish-American War, becoming a U.S. colony from 1898 to 1946, during which there were, time, there, you know, there were waves of, of Filipinos migrating to the United States. Um, you know, within that period, as, and then of course it increased after the this uh, the Immigration Act of 1965. And so, so my family was both came out of both uh, the first waves of like um, farm workers and industry workers to folks who came in, in who came after 65 as well which was the l larger increase more recently okay. um uh, the, the filipino american national historical society first declared uh, observing uh, filipino american history month in october of 1992 so this year has been a very important year for the filipino american national Hist historical society because it's been you know over 40 years of, of like observing that um, and then it, in, in October, we commemorate the first recorded, why, why October, and it's, which is next month, folks are asking, why is October such an important month for Filipinos in the United States? It's because it's uh, the Filipino American National Historical, Historical Society um, has proclaimed that the first recorded presence of Filipinos, um, Filipinos, I'm gonna put that in quotes, in, in the continental US, United States occurred on October 18th, 1587. And those Filipinos and were 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 um, labeled Luzones Indios. So those are Indian uh, from the island of Luzon, which is the northern island in the archipelago of the Philippines. Um, that they came ashore uh, on the, the Spanish galleon named the Nuestra Señora de Esperanza and landed in what is now, what I think we all know as Morro Bay in California. So there's a there's one a history of you know, the United States in its <laughs> expansion, as well as the, the reality that Filipinos or Luzones Indios were, were actually part of the, you know, um, the Spanish galleon during, during that colonial period of Spain. Um, and, in, and to continue, um, we, we, so we've been um, recognizing Filipino American History Month in October, um, and it was a resolution that was actually um, passed by the Congress in 2009, and actually President Obama recognized it officially um, in, in, during, his, um, during his administration. Um, the proclamation of also October 25th in, in, is Larry Itliang Day in the state of California, and, uh, and actually now even na nationally. Um, Larry Itliang was born in October 25th of 1913. He was born in, in Pangasinan in San, Nicol San Nicolas in the Philippines. And, he became a very um, vocal uh, labor movement figure for Filipinos in that el in that first generation, and so we've been celebrating uh, the, lab the the beginning of the labor movement uh, for farm workers here, also in the in the desert, because the first strike that happened before the great grape strike of 1965 in Delena was actually here in the Coachella Valley. So we're very well, that's one of the proud moments of like sort of being part of this history of Filipinos who help with ushering in, for instance, the 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 act the the activism of Senior Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta and the the you know the National Farm Workers Association, which came together to, to form you know Filipinos and Mexican farm workers, but Latino farm, farm, farm workers came together to help form the United Farm Workers, and I'm so proud to say that we're part of that um, we're descendants of that hi history. Um, so that gives you a sense of where why there are Filipinos here too. Um, my my grandfather was also part of, you know was a a lot of Filipinos, Filipinos were enlisted during World War II. So we're looking at sort of a post-war influx of Filipinos um, after uh, after 1946, um, it, which is the end of World War II, as well as the end of the Commonwealth period of the Philippines. So I think that puts into a perspective of why Filipinos and Filipinos count as the they, they count as the largest Asian American and Pacific Islander group in in here in the desert. But we're also um, probably the largest ethnic a third largest ethnic group in California itself. So I hope that gives you a sort of background. My neighborhood was, actually, was, was, was um, started with a lot of, of, of World War II veterans as well as inclusive of the Filipinos who did come after 1946. Wow, that's pretty exciting. That's pretty exciting. So now from that beginning, from, from kind of, you know, coming over, uh, working uh, as part of the labor movement, at this point, what would a, uh, a profile look like of uh, the Filipino population in our community. What what are they doing now? What kind of work and what are some of the things that you feel are 
uh, the accomplishments that you'd like to talk about? That, that's a wonderful question. I, I, the profile now is very similar yet dissimilar to what I just spoke about. We, we do still have, um, I, I know I, I, I've, we have family members who are in so many different industries and I think you, you'll, you'll notice that, I think a lot of folks will notice that we're in the medical industry, so you'll see a lot of nurses and doctors. Um, you all, but you also see in this neighborhood that we, where we grew up, we were, you know, a lot of folks are still um, housekeepers um, working in environmental services, um, janitorial services, um, as well as working in other fields in, um, inclusive of like um, business owners. So like in my in the neighborhood here, Veterans Track, we actually have a, a number of businesses, including an air conditioning company, to like. Um, uh, an AJ market, which is a, a Filipino owned um, market in a, you know, Pan Asian market. Um, um, a lot of folks here also in my neighborhood have found like a lot of different religious sort of um, entities. And I was, it was great to be part of the, the summit that you had recently for, for, for the organization and to meet, uh, you know, other um, um, community leaders who were working in um, Christian-based or faith-based organizations, because that's one of the things that a lot that's influenced me as well as our, you know, the folks in Bainingham Desert. A lot of members come out of different denominations, but one in particular, the, the Palm Springs uh, Filipino American Seventh Day Adventist Church was founded actually in this neighborhood in Palm Springs, though it's you know brick and mortar is now in Desert Hot Springs. But the congregation started in the the, the 80s here and still are very much thriving here. Um, but yeah, folks are st folks are in all different industries. Um, we're one of the things that comes out of here too is that we're right by Demuth Park, so we're, our Demuth Community Center is actually home for one of the more um, well-known um, Philippine basketball association groups. So oh. on Tuesdays, you know they'll they'll meet um, and have, play ball and and they'll have food. So wow. they'll have a, a mix of like food and, and sport, which is really exciting. Well, well, that sounds like a good transition for me to ask a little bit about some of the cultural and arts events that are coming up and things that have been done in our community. What the, the big thing that we're working on right now is with, uh, hopefully, and we're across our fingers, um, and I, I can actually show you if, you, if you allow me, I could show, share some images if, if that's possible. If, you, if I share a screen, I could show you a, a one project that we're working on as by Indian Desert. Um, and hopefully with um, Demuth Community Center and the city of Palm Springs, because it's still in the process of being, uh, you know, sort of going through its approvals. Um, would it be okay to share like some images? I could show you, I could show you some art, which would be kind of fun. Um, can, can we make that happen? There you go. It's available now. Go ahead. Thank you, Angelica. You're welcome. Let me see if I could find it. Um, <laughs> my, my laptop is, desktop is horrible. Um, I'm going to show you at there least um can you see that yes okay i'm gonna pull up the all right you know what um i'll show you something that's kind of fun um this is a uh, actually some images from early like filipino american club um posters and programs so the this this provides a sort of level of like one um uh, i'm gonna go to enter full screen so you don't see all that background. Um, the, these are sort of covers of some of the Philippine American Club uh, uh, programs. Uh, a lot of times in the, pavil the pavilion hosted, the pavilion is actually right by the Palm Springs Public Library and the, and the public pool. Uh, the pavilion ho hosted some of the most exciting fiestas um, that, that the Filipino community would organize. So these are just some, some I'm actually leading up to sort of a, this is a visual sort of um, influence on what we're working on. So these are some of the really exciting, this is something from the late 70s, like 1979. There we go, some disco Filipinos. Um, now, now, your screen didn't change for us, so. It, it didn't? No, so you might want to check your share, just unshare and share again. Is that better? Can you see that? We're looking, we're looking at your Instagram for um. Oh, yeah. Uh, That's right. Take your time. Let me get to my. Oh, you know what it is because I um. Let me do this again. Thank you for your patience. Oh, it's we're we're thankful for you sharing. Yes, is, now we're with you. Is that better? Yes. I wanted to show you the. Okay, here we go. Nineteen. Can okay? Can you see this already? Yes. 
And that, can you see that? We see Fiesta. Okay, can you see that? It's another one. Yes. Okay, great. Couple. <laughs> Thanks for your patience. So the, these are uh, some of the uh, um, sort of um, program Im images from the Filipino American Club, which is actually probably the longest running um, Filipino American Association here in the desert. And they actually had a sort of break um, in the early 2000s, but they, they re, um, reformed again and um, are, are organizing programming. Um, there's also another organization called the National Alliance for Filipino Americans, which is based out here, and they, they actually do uh, medical outreach to, to not only the Filipino communities, but all communities, so that if they need access to a doctor, um, in, including um, dental and x-rays and things like that, we, we do that every, I think it's now it's every quarter. quarter. Wow, that's great. So this is some images from like 1980. Um, that's my aunt in the middle. Aunt Rosie, and she's still uh, she's just still with us, thankfully. And Manong Oscar Rodas is actually the current president, one of the current presidents or leaders of the Filipino American. Uh, it's called the Philam Association of Coachella Valley. So this get, again, we, I can share this with you later, but this gives you a sense of a quick history of, of the Filipino Association in, in Palm Springs. Um, I want to share with you, I'm going to do this one more time again. Is that okay, Angelica? Sure. I'm going to stop here and then I'm going to open up another one. I'm going to share the, the PDF of our... This one. Give me one second. I had it right. I had it ready for y'all, and like it's like lost now. <laughs> it always happens this way. What is that? Get here we go. I had it ready. Oh, there it is. Piney Hot Desert. There it is. Is it another? <clears throat> okay. Can you see that okay? Yes, the mural project. Right. Yeah, yes, it's the mural project. Yes, sir. There we go. So this gives you a quick uh, a quick overview. This is something we presented, and I think Kwana is probably very familiar with this because I and Jilska because I, I presented to the I, pre I presented this to the desert. I'm sorry, the Demuth Park Neighborhood Organization just recently. Um, this is the Philippine X Community Mural Project that we're proposing uh, as a public art project through Bayanihan Desert. Um, again, who we are is we are a multi generational. Filipino Community Action Network a of diverse individuals who identify as Filipino American and are based in the Palm Springs region. We celebrate our heritage collectively, share news, promote our achievements, and identify and support underrepresented perspectives and issues, particularly those of concern to Asian American and Pacific Island communities throughout the Coachella Valley. This is a, an example of sort of some of the programming we've done um, this, from our Instagram. Um, on the left, you'll see some some names of uh, the of businesses here in the in Palm Springs also. Um, Dead or Alive actually is no longer, but Dead or Alive has been around. Lola's Casina, which is Michelle Casino's project, um, AJ Market, and um, please follow us on um, as by Nihon Desert on Instagram, and you could see some. We we've we've hosted a number of some very similar to what you, you're doing here with the virtual cafe um, on topics around mental health, the movement for Black Lives, building um, by Nihon. Um, by Nihon as a term um, refers to the idea of building community in, through a collective process. Um, and the in in the art history of, of by Nihon or of the depiction of by Nihon and paintings, for instance, it's been depicted as this image of a fa of a of your neighbors carrying literally your the homes the nipa huts that that can be uh, carried from one location to another. So that that. That that um, literal moving of a home is part of what we're talking about in this idea of building um, culture. Um, so we're working on a Philippine X community project, which we hope to um, have at Demuth Community Center. So if you if you get to uh, you know whisper in the ears of any of our planning uh, 
planning, public arts commissions, and um, parks and rec, please um, please do that. Uh, we're working with the, with the wonderful artist who came out of also who's also from the desert. Um, uh, Adam Lebuen Garcia. This is an example of his work from San Francisco on the right. Um, and um, this is an image of the, the of the of the park uh, here in Duluth. And that's the wall we're proposing it. It's sort of if you're familiar with it, the community center has that sort of first wall um, that's textured. But what we're hoping to see we'll, we'll see where it goes. Um, there's an image of the Philippine uh, Basketball Association that's what comes out of the community center. Here's some more work by Adam Lebuen Garcia, who's again a local artist of Filipino descent, who's going to be working with us. Um, and he's he's great. He's worked with the Smithsonian, and um, these are sort of the areas of what we're trying to do: is working on research, community forums to gather input in archival images, conversations with the artists, proposals to, to have you know that will bring in input from the community, and then de and develop public programs and edu education. Where some of the history that we're really trying to focus in on, and that's an image of uh, Larry Itliang on the on the right, with uh, the gentleman with the glasses. Um, our veterans, farm workers, medical service community, our religious commu organizations, community activists, business owners, service organizations, silver servants, plants, nature, gardens. Um, it, we one of the things that we did with Bayanihan Desert um, was actually during the the districting of Palm Springs and in particular our neighborhood, we were we were able to identify a lot of Philippine. Filipino um, households by the plants that were in their in their yards, and in particular the moringa plants. And Jilska and I have been talking about moringa in particular because it's a it's a it's a cultural marker of Filipino homes, or at least homes that used to be owned by Filipinos in in our neighborhood. Um, that which speaks to the idea of legacy. The image on the right is actually one of the proposed um, images that we were were hoping to work with um, around a, a mural of of Filipino ness also. Um, and giving giving um, respect to our our uh, our, our maternal um, predecessors. Fantastic. So as as we're having this conversation, one of the thoughts that comes to me is it seems that art is very important to people of color. I mean, you know, can can you speak a little bit to? I know you you said you've done a lot of work in, as a curator and and cultural with cultural affairs. Can you speak to some of why you think that art is so important and how um, people of color in particular um, benefit from art? Um, I'm really happy to say that this this mural in particular is probably very much influenced by one, a local history. Uh, I know that there's a lot of attention on the mural at, at Desert Highland, at James O'Jesse. So you could see this as part of this history. And if you look at the history of muralism in the Coachella Valley, there are a lot of murals. And this, this you know, the desert's known for really propping its muralists and, and the mural movement, mural, mural art movement, if you will. Um, the history of mural mural art is very much related to the history of social realism as well. I know if we were to look at the the history of mural art coming out of uh, the Mexican muralists, for instance, um, they were very much um, a key to like, um, a, and they were attuned to the struggle of, uh, you know, of communities that were underserved and overlooked and and um, and de and and degraded, you know, and and over, you know, just devastated communities so they in their in their murals they were able to really address those political you know issues even overtly sometimes metaphorically and that's what what we're seeing too with um adam's work that he's really looking at the you know the sort of level of one um, um animal and nature having sort of these real ways of speaking about struggle in a com community as well you could you know you could definitely talk about the history of, of, of nature in its relationship to our neighborhood. Um, but you could definitely re relate all this work to a, lo a lot of our, you know, our murals of color that, that have done amazing works over the past <laughs> few decades. Um, you know, from, from, you know, Aaron Douglas to, to Jacob Lawrence even, you know, I think I was speaking to our, our, our dear friends here and we were talking about the Great Migration, the Great Migration and and is is a very important history to um to what is to to why um families are here in the desert also and when we when we, we i i definitely relate uh, the the history of like filipinos in, in in their migration to also 
the parallel to not just parallel, but you know the real the, the, the real relationship of of African Americans moving from the South into the West and into yeah. the North. But I, the the murals here in the desert are great influences on what we're looking at right now, and they speak volumes of what's of what our you know our history has gone through in terms of struggle. And it would seem to me that young people in particular are you know attracted to murals as an expression. Uh, can can you speak a little bit to to that and maybe some of the ways that you think we can uh, help our youth and and you know kind of revitalize their excitement and interest in that? I'm I'm very proud to say that I've you know I know a number of muralists here in the desert who are much much younger than me who have who produce amazing bodies of work that are, that are on you know physical walls you know from from our artists like Sofia Enriquez. I think a, a lot of you may know Sofia's work, but she's definitely looked, um, she's definitely depicted um, one, uh, again, um, the women in her family, for instance, as a, as a great way to sort of build on how she speaks about culture and, and, um, and, um, and feminism, you know, in art. Um, to artists like, uh, goodness, um, uh, there's that I'm forgetting his name right now because it, it's been a while but like there's a mural on Ramon Road if you see uh, right right before um, between um, Gene Autry and Lawrence Crossley um, that has a, this this wonderful image of, of the scales the scales of justice mm -hmm. and like I think those, those have a really you know we, you know the the those have a real big impact on sort of being that you know it's that idea of the quotidian right the every day when you drive by that mural every day you're always reminded of struggle and not only struggle but about the uplift that something like something gorgeous like this that's sort of speaking the the you know the truth of of, of their history and their you know what they what they're putting into their community is is very much an everyday uh, occurrence so i think that speaks volumes and i'm so glad i'm so i'm you know i'm always inspired every day by by the, the work of, of those much, much younger than me. <laughs> well, well, that's a good thing. Well, you know, part of our, our, our mission at We Are One United is really trying to bring these communities together so that number one, they um, can exercise their voice, their power in the work that is around them. Uh, what would you say are some of the issues or concerns or goals and uh, achievements you'd like to see us, you know, kind of pay more attention to? You know, um, and I'm, again, I'm very fortunate that I was part of the, this, the discussion at the summit. Um, but yeah, I, I know that I, um, I spoke very much, I'm, I'm very much interested in one, you know, uh, I think I'm always told, you know, I've, I've, I've been very fortunate and I've been, I'm very grateful about that because it's like I've, I've sort of made an inroad on my, on my own to sort of like go and serve on a human rights commission, for instance, or I'm currently also serving on the equity and social justice committee for the city of Palm Springs, which is a very much an extension of that. Um, we're looking at, you know, issues r related to race in, this, in the city and th the reality is like a lot of times I'm, a t you know, it's tokenizing. You know, I think there is a real level of sort of tokenization that happens on a grand scale <laughs> in a city environment, which is very, very unfortunate because it's like, okay, we've got folks of color talking about this issue, you know, and again, it's always about having, you know, to get only very, uh, you know, being, not even being at the table, you know, it's, it's, it's always like it's on the marginal sort of state of like, oh, you know, we sort of know there's, Filipinos living in this neighborhood, but we don't really know what the, what they really need, and then then we'll then we'll be blamed for not speaking up because we we're not <laughs> invited to the to the table anyway. So it's like, why you know why why would you be part of a system that has already excluded you from the beginning? You're you're already erased. Your erasure is is not only well you know um, well heralded by white supremacy, but like <laughs> but it's also very much heralded by the fact that people don't want you to talk about it because it you know a lot of folks are like going what the, the Philippines was part of a was a colony of the United States what you know I thought it was in the Caribbean you know where is it you know where's the Philippines where's the Philippines why you know why do they have Spanish last names you know surnames you know family names there's a whole history there 
And I think and when I say I, I feel like there's a level of tokenization on a grand scale, it's because you know what? I'll be one of the only Filipinos that's speaking at a, at a, at a at an event or a program, and you know I'm like I'm not gonna speak for everybody, you know, and I'm not gonna be you know, I'm not, and I'm not gonna be told by someone. And this has happened. I'm gonna be very specific now. This happened at a neighborhood organization meeting where f folks are like, oh, we were told that Filipinos don't really matter, you know. They um, because he told us that you know they're, they're a lost cause. That's what they were, that's what we were told. <laughs> they're a lost cause because they, they don't re they're not really active. They don't really speak up, which is all all the you know sort of racist sort of um, tropes that we're talking about, um, which helps again, you know, super su su sort of supersede that level of like, you know, we could talk about okay, we need more Filipinos to talk, but if you're not going to be invited to that table, it's it's different. You're you're already excluded and, and erased from the conversation. So I think that is a sort of a I'm I'm putting in the perspective of a larger uh, take on it. But like there are clearly a lot of different public programs or um, I'm sorry, um, public issues that need to be t addressed too. From like you know one like things like um, just getting more uh, folks involved. Um, you know, and that that would mean like um, inviting them to the table again, like to 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 vote. You know, I think we did we we made some inroads a few years ago, and we were we were able to like help really usher in the first um, um, uh, uh, the first representative from District One, Grace Gar Grace Elena Garner, to, to represent us in District One, and like that was really exciting. And we're excited to hopefully get her, you know, to to be reelected so she'll be become the first Latinx Latina like mayor of the city of Palm Springs. So those are the kind of things that can happen. And that and the reason why that happens is because someone like Grace actually is not just having to she's already, she's already invited us to the table. So we we're, we're we're already in discussion. So that we're already sort of we know what's been sort of affecting us for for generations in in our neighborhoods. But a lot of times when we're we're in a room and it's predominantly white, you're like you don't you don't you don't feel like it's going to contribute much really because it's just like this sort of same level of like again usurpation that that that's historically has happened to our communities and devastated and de devastated us for a long time that's a big answer to a <laughs> small no, question that was great that was that was great i mean i think it opens the door for why we are here you know when we were at the summit one of the things that i recognize as well is that we have to make that change. We have to not just get invited to the table, but in some ways invite ourselves to the table, right? Sometimes we just have to be there, um, whether we were welcomed or or, or whether we, we decided that this is too important to, to let go any longer. You know, I think, um, you know, it's one thing and, it, and it's very true that there is a, you know, there's, there's a history of, of being left out, but but it would be our fault if we allowed ourselves to be kept out any longer. And so one of the things we hope that we can do at We Are One is, is change that. And I think you've done some of those things in terms of you know being on those commissions, even though I do recognize sometimes it's tough when you're the only one of whatever that is in the room. But at the same time, sometimes it helps others in our communities when they see that someone made it into the room to begin to believe that they can make it into the room too. So I know that you have a monthly meeting. Do you guys, you guys meet pretty regularly? Is that correct? Um, as by any hand desert? Yes. We're always texting each other. So yeah. but in terms of so, our meetings, they, they, they've actually been more uh, every few months uh, right now. Okay, because one of the things that I'm hoping is that as you bring your tables together, you'll invite more folks like me so that as, as you start having these discussions, instead of it being kind of siloed out, that now it becomes a little bit more uh, you know, diverse, and it will allow, uh, I'm hoping two things to happen. One, just relationship building, right? I, I think too often, again, there's there's a, a lot of value in keeping people kind of divided and separated, you know, not working together. And so I think we can change that, that mindset. I think we can change that. And number two, I think we find that we often have a lot of 
common, you know, interests. And too often, again, um, I don't know what your interests are. You know, I don't know enough, which is one of the reasons I'm so excited for you to be here tonight. But just doing this once isn't going to be enough. We we have to do this as, as part of our self-education so that we all learn the value that each one of us brings to the table. I, I want to applaud you for, you know, kind of, being able to hang in there the way you have. But I also want to say, you know, we, we can't just pat you on the back and say, well, thank you, good job. We have to do more. We have to be accessible. We have to be able to stand up and be able to say, you know, we're here with you. Sometimes even to the point of recognizing the need to prioritize some things that will help you over some things that I think may help me. But in the long run, when you take a step forward, you know, I, I have this saying, right? A, a rising tide floats all ships, right? And sometimes we don't act like that. Sometimes we act like, uh, you know, to use a, a colloquial expression that I used to hear, I just got to get mine, you know, I just need to get mine. But I think if we're going to really change those systems that you were talking about, we're really going to make a difference um, then, then it's going to come from, you know, uh, doing things together. I remember, uh, you know, we have rich histories and we, we have rich histories. We don't have to go out and manufacture a narrative. We have a narrative. We just need to make sure that we're sharing that with one another so that, you know, our young part of our mission is to try to make sure we help lower the level of violence and 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 you know uh crime in the community and you know i think that's that's all of our responsibility that's not the responsibility i, I would like to you know certainly see the police do what they're supposed to do but in the end what makes my community safe is that my neighbor has got my back, you know, my, that, that I know who my neighbor is. I, I come from a city, Philadelphia, where our houses touch each other. So we know each other's business because we don't have a choice, right? I mean, it just comes right through the wall. When I came to California, I saw people who for years never knew who the person was on the left or right of them uh, and, you know, didn't speak, didn't, you know, didn't communicate. Um, we have to change those things. I want to thank you for for coming and you know helping us to to begin to glimpse in. But I think we just are getting a glimpse if that makes any sense. And also, I want more people from the community. You know, there you know there's been a, a lot of impact in your community. As you said, you do a lot of work in the medical field. And, and we recognize that we just came out of a pandemic that has had, in many ways, a traumatic effect on those folks who work in healthcare. Um, and at the same time, uh, as a community, there's a lot of opportunity in the assets that are part of our community. And, and we need to know, you know that there are people there who can help other people you know, come into those fields, you know, because usually the way you get in is who you know, right? You know, if you know somebody and an opening comes up, you say, oh, well, maybe this person would be interested. That's that's the way we, we start to open some doors. Um, one of the, the things I'd like to do um, as, as we, we continue is just ask you, what's one thing, you know, you got a few people here, they're listening, they're pretty excited. Um, you know, the one thing that I've, I've learned over time is that the more you can share with people, the more they're able to have that aha moment and say, you know, I hadn't thought about that. What do you think would be one thing that you might want to say to this group that would maybe uh, help to have have that aha moment? if you don't mind. I think that's a w wonderful question. I don't necessarily work on aha moments, by the way, but like, I love I love that because I think I had, 
Um, can I share an aha moment that I had this, this past weekend? They just probably very much related to what we're talking about here. And I, and and John, I appreciate what you said because I and and thank you for reminding me too. I mean, one of the things about I'm just going to rewind to what, one of the things that you did say was that you know, and and Filipinos were, you know, they're they're in the medical fields in such a great number. So it we were disproportionately affected by COVID. And as you know, I mean, the numbers that were, were staggering in terms of people getting sick, obviously, but then also dying. So we saw so many of our medical field, you know, one folks in the medical field who were Filipino who were dying. And then, then we saw the numbers as we disaggregate to um, from groups of like Asian Pacific Islanders. We saw that, you know, the Pacific Islander numbers were, were also horrendously like disproportionate. And clearly, one of the things that we also saw were that you know of color you know the the latin acts as well as the african american numbers were just again staggering so i i appreciate it and i think that's you know one thing is that we could be reminded that we are all disproportionately like affected by something like a pandemic but it's definitely a, a, a real opportunity to bring us all together to, to to defeat you know things like that to really help build you know a healthy community that you know that you know will keep keep not only ourselves safe but all those who we know and love and those around us safe from getting sick um the one thing that i did i was really excited to i want to share with you in terms of aha moment um was i, I did attend this this really awesome um advocacy day of advocacy and uh the the keynote speaker it was our secretary of state for the state of california dr shirley weber who is one of my most favorite She's one of my most favorite people. <laughs> she's just amazing, and she, you know, she. What she started off, and there were two things that really. I mean, there are a whole bunch of things that she said that really stuck with me. But Dr. Weber, um, as you know, um, is a great advocate for um, ethnic studies and 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 for our, our academic um, development. But one of the first things that she said to me was like, you know, I feel like you know she, this. She was speaking to a group of more progressive, I guess you will, like voters, Democrats in a lot of ways. Um, she, so she said like, oh yeah, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir or speaking to the choir, but she reminded us, she's like, well, you know, a choir needs to practice. And I was like, <laughs> that started oh, off, me, that was the beginning of her speech and I'm just like, exactly. Because I, I think a lot of times, you know, we are, we may be speaking to a choir, but the reality is our choirs always do need practice and they practice daily. You know, and I think every minute of the day. Um, I think that's an aha moment that I wanted to share. I think it's really, you know, I think we're, we may be in this together sometimes, but we also have to remind that we have to always be learning from each other as well every day. Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate that. And I, you know, as I, as you said that, I, I remember there is like this, oh, it's the choir, they're okay kind of mentality, right? Nobody needs to, they're, they're going to be, but really, I have to tell you, as a person who has worked with faith-based organizations for a long time, sometimes some of the craziest stuff is going on in the choir. <laughs> and, 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 you know, nobody on the outside knows, right? Because all they hear is the singing on Sunday morning. But Monday through Saturday, oh, my goodness, it's like being in a crazy place. And, and I think that's, that's okay because life isn't intended to be easy or simple what it is it's intended to be lived and and for us to help one another through those crises and through those challenges and to be there when we fall down to help us get back up and i think sometimes we've lost some of that i think we've lost our, our awareness that you know would remind us that you know what i am my brother's keeper i am here to help you know, I, I remember years ago, there was a, a guy, he was um, trying to promote um, a, a, a binder that he had created for parents. And, and he wanted them to be able to um, help their children prepare for college. And he was, he was trying to get people to understand, you don't start that when you're a junior in high school, you start that when you're in the, the sixth grade, when you're in the fourth, fifth, sixth grade. And so, you know, he, he came to me and he says, you know, would it be okay if I, you know, presented this to, to, to the congregation that you're working with? And I was like, well, how can I help you? And, and he almost, his mouth just fell open. I said, well, what's wrong? 
And he said, no one's ever asked me that question before. How can I help you? And I think sometimes we forget that we need to ask the question. I was reminded that often we can help one another, but often we don't ask for the help. And so, you know, we need to be more open, but I really believe there are so many open doors already. We just have to make sure that we're paying attention to those opportunities. This has been a great opportunity talking with you. Uh, I, 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 I'm learning some stuff. Um, and you know, I'm not young, right? I'm, I'm really, so, so, so I was in the class of 69 graduating high school. So you can figure that math out. But what I want to say is you bring value to us every time we are willing to listen to you. And, and we want to be able to share that value for the benefit of the whole community. I think that's that's got to be our message. So I am, uh, first and foremost, uh, want to just check. I don't know, did anybody have anything? If you had a question for Edwin, if you want to put it in the chat, um, we'd be glad to share it with him because I think we got a, a few more minutes, like about five more minutes left. So if anybody would like to, or if you really feel bold tonight and you'd actually like to unmute yourself and, and ask Edwin, uh, please, this is an opportunity. Don't let it go by. By the way, really like your shirt too, by the way. Don't let everybody know that. <laughs> uh, but if you were a little bit larger, I'd be talking to you about that shirt. So thank you very much. It's Indonesian. Yeah, I like it. I like and it. happy birthday, by the way, um, belated. Oh, Mr. oh gosh. Thank you. As most appreciated. Anybody, any questions? Okay. Well, Edwin, I, again. Yeah, I have a question. Oh, 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 I'm so surprised. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, it's not really a total question, but what I'm looking at, because when I look at your culture and when I look at where I was born, uh, we love dancing, we love art, and so on. But for a long time, it took us time to realize that really music is really an entrepreneur or a business that can really bring in a lot of money. Even art, some people could make art and they can't sell it with a good value, mainly minority, because either there is no market or what they're making is not with the modern uh, standard that could make money. So how can we convert the art into real, real income for communities uh that's really my question if you, i don't know if it's understood no we i think we did edwin did you get that yeah i did Zubair, that's a great question you know i've been meaning to ask um um where does your accent come from i'm i was intrigued because we i know we met quickly the other day oh where do i come from yeah, yes. I was born in Africa in a small country called Uganda. There's no small country. <laughs> I love it. That's great. Yeah. Thank you, Zubair. I That's a great question. And that's actually something that I've been really um, struggling with personally, um, only because, you know, I, I was supporting, when I was, work, when I was working as a curator in New York, I was supporting a lot of artists. But I made a very specific, I made a very specific quest to work with artists of color, especially. And especially artists of color who may not be coming from a um, a, a wealthy point of view as well, or a, well, a wealthy background. And I think that was one of, so when you work from scarcity, you always find very, very exciting things happening. So I, I, I my first jobs were in, the, were in the Bronx, but not only just working with Bronx artists, but working with artists of color in particular, because that, that museum's collection was founded on the, uh, after the civil rights movement, founded actually the same year I was born, 1971, but they were founded to collect the works of artists of color, in particular artists of a Asian, African, and Latin American ancestry. So when they have that as a focus, that was one of the things that really attracted to me working at a museum like the Bronx Museum, um, and then eventually working for the Studio Museum in Harlem, which works specifically with arts of African and African American um, descent. Um, and when I say it that way, it's because what, what I was witnessing is that when a lot of art, most artists, and this is the reality of it, most artists, contemporary artists, mu music as well as visual art, they most artists do not make 
um, um, living off their work, their 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 creative work. Unfortunately, I mean that's one of the things that I you know I not I say it straight up because it's like, um, I was looking at I was working with a, a whole host of artists. We were working in a, in a in an area of career development for them in particular. You know where they could help develop writing. You know writing about the art, uh, how to present their the work to, to to opportunities. But I know that the conversation was always that most artists do not make work make a living off their art and music unfortunately it's a very very small percentage of folks who are very very successful who could say that they've they've done it i'm a curator uh, by trade and as a curator i don't make money but uh, but but if i was seeing that was with curators and the administrative side part of it then and the makers of our, our culture and our art are not making the, the a living off of it then that's a huge disparity in this country and it, it was and it's replicated not just here but it's through this idea of a market and it's again the idea of capital a capital driven society so i i always push for the idea that if we're going to help develop that that we help our artists you know we that we buy the work of the art the artists that we you know have been supporting you know provide them with that so they can go and make more work more make more music more make more, more art but the reality is that it, it it's it's really hard to sustain it unless you know they find a, in a market driven society a market that really supports them and you know you'll see this is happening there are a lot of artists who are coming out of you know these communities of color who are doing very very well now but again when you look at it it's a very very small percentage of our artists of color who are actually making it so i want to say that we keep, let's let's develop our our, our collectors our you know our, our communities who can help you know sustain hopefully um, you know help sustain our artists to keep making thank you edward all right. Well, posted in the chat is a, a link to um, Edwin's organization. You can follow him on Instagram. Also, we'd love to have you follow us on Instagram. Um, I, I got to tell you some pretty exciting stuff going on out here. Um, I want to thank you, Edwin, for being our guest tonight. This has been a wonderful, you know, you know how you know it's good is when is over and you feel like you could keep going that that's a good that's a good thing and so i want to i want to say thank you to our guests